Hello. 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 Suddenly, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, and he is awoken by a shaking of his bed. And in California, there are a lot of earthquakes. He wakes up suddenly and realizes there's just been an earthquake. And as a journalist, he needs to do something to document this. He, as I said, he works for the LA Times. He gets up, walks across the room to his computer, opens a program on his computer, but presses a few buttons, he has a story there about a 3.6 earthquake in the area. He makes a few edits and sends it to the LA Times. And then it's on the front page within three minutes of the earthquake happening. His name is on the story, but did he write it? Well, the answer is no, he did not write it. A robot did. It's actually a true story. There is a program at the LA Times now. It is a robot, but not in the way that you think of robots. Maybe you're thinking of the Terminator or Robocop or I'm dating myself because those are old movies, but a physical robot. No. This is a program, an engineering program that the LA Times has adopted to document earthquakes that are of a certain level. And this program writes the story. It goes to a live human being. That person reads it really quick. And the, suddenly the LA Times has a story before anyone else about where this earthquake was and how bad it was. And this program, this robot, is called QuakeBot. And how can this be, robots in newsrooms? We're going to talk about this quite a bit today, but first we have to talk about how it got started, this new media thing. And so first we have to talk about what is new media? What am I talking about? Well, most of you already know because in your hands, taking pictures, are tiny little media generators, cell phones, cameras, you know, maybe you have tablets also in your lap, as well as a cell phone. In our new media age, we all have the technology to create our own little newsrooms. You can probably take better photos than some of my really nice cameras at home with your tiny cell phone. And so when we talk about new media, we're talking about YouTube, we're talking about Waymo, we're talking about WeChat, we're talking about all the different ways that you pass information with the click of a button on your cell phone or your tablet or your laptop. These are all new media ways. WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, all of these things. And so I'm going to talk about why, how did we get here? How did we get to a point where um, we, we're not just going to hold a newspaper and find out what just happened yesterday but we want to know what happened five minutes ago. And so we go to a website, or we go to our Twitter feed, or we go to Facebook, or we go to Weibo, or WeChat. So the part of the answer lies in, of course, a phone in every hand. Another part of the answer lies in a lessened trust in the news media. And we're going to talk about that very very much in detail. Why, why are, no, are we not trusting the news media anymore? So all of these things combined create a new need. We want information now, 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 now. We become a now culture. 
So, why? Why, why are we suddenly in, in the new media realm? Well, let's talk about trust first. So this is shocking to me, and it makes me sad, <laughs> because the United States, where I spent 15 years of my career, now the news media is 30, there's 30, 33% of people say, okay, I trust the news media, 33%. We are way at the bottom. Finland is totally winning this race. And you know why, why is that? Well, there are lots of reasons. Journalists have done bad things over time, but also there have been just there are new needs, and a lot of people feel like their voice is not being represented by the media, and there are fake news stories that have destroyed credibility many times for newspapers, for broadcasts, for radio. But trust is a big, big deal for journalists, and if you lost trust, you lose audience and new, new media comes in to fill that need. So it's not much different in the Arab world. The uh, Arab, young, Arab young people, they mainly go to online websites, to social media, to find out what is happening right now, because they have an urgent need, what is happening right now. They do not go to newspapers. It hurts my heart. I spend a lot of time in newspapers but they do still go to broadcast. So what, what happens when you lose trust in media over time is that other media steps in to take the place. And in many times, it's been citizen journalists. I call them sideshows, um, similar to mojos or mobile journalists, people who travel with everything you need to create a story. These citizen journalists, have come in with their phones, with their, with their laptops, to, to a situation to cover a story in their own way. And it, for instance, during the Arab Spring, there were, there were so many different ways that journalists, citizen journalists, were covering different protests. And they were doing it not just in text, but they were doing it in highly, highly technical ways crowdsourcing, putting a request out over social media and saying, have you heard this? Where have you heard this? Respond back to us so we can maybe make a map of where these protests are happening so people can go, so people can know. And, and in Syria, even today, there is a tool that citizen journalists are using called Syria Tracker. And they literally track deaths in different neighborhoods, when a bomb falls, they will attach a name to a location, and literally a person's death is, is charted and remembered. And so this is updated even today, every single day, Syria Tracker. And in the United States, during race riots a couple years ago in Ferguson, Missouri, citizen journalists covered every instance of a, any type of interaction between the public and the police, because there was quite a lot of tension between the public and the police, and so there were always cameras going. And sometimes, sometimes that tells the whole story, but many times it does not. So, what I'm getting at here is, there are holes when untrained journalists get into journalism when you have not been trained in accuracy, in objectivity, and morality within journalism, because we have our own cult code of ethics. And so this is where robots begin to come in. And they have their own questionable difference and distance from accuracy, objectivity, and moral ethical codes. Now, I would like to mention a buzzword. It is all over the place. Fake news. And in the United States, it has become this awful, awful brand on journalists right now. How do you tell if a story is fake or if it's real? How do you tell, did 
Did the Pope actually endorse Donald Trump? No, but that story was everywhere during the election. Now, I'd like to show you two examples of fake news stories that got shared all over social media, all over websites, all over the world, totally fake. The first is a very scary picture of, <laughs> of a giant, giant storm suddenly. It's, oh man, it's the end of the world over, over New York Harbor there. And this was put, up, put out right at the time that a massive storm, a real storm, Hurricane Sandy, was blowing into the eastern shores of the United States. And so everybody took it seriously, and they were scared. And so this picture ran all over the world, in print, in broadcast, all over social media, Twitter. It was photoshopped, totally fake news, okay? Another story that had quite serious consequences was this fake news story that big publications picked up about, oh, Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber has cancer? And so people started shaving their heads. Go bald for Bieber, they said. And as you see, even big websites like Entertainment Tonight picked up this story and all these lovely ladies shoving, like shaving their beautiful hair for poor Justin Bieber, who did not have cancer. <laughs> he was not sick with cancer. And may he live a thousand years. So, this is one consequence of, of the new media sort of push, takeover uh, within journalism right now, is that we don't always have a lens, we don't always have a filter to know what's real and what's not. So, I still believe in human beings, but we still have to talk about robots. So, <clears throat> hence the robot revolution. A few years ago, and it's been about five years, um, several major media outlets, Associated Press, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, adopted a new method to do less, do more, do more with less, which is what we're always told in the journalism business. You must, must, must do more with less. You must push your stories to Twitter first before you even publish. You must push your stories to Facebook first. Now, the Associated Press took a program out of my home state, North Carolina. This program was called Wordsmith. And yes, it's an engineered robot program in which you take a set of numbers. Say you have election night returns. You have a set of numbers. And you write a classic inverted triangle story, sort of a, a template. And then when those election numbers come in, the moment they come in, you feed them straight into this robot, and it spits out your story. And we're talking 20 seconds. It is fast. And so you have that story before any other news outlet. You know who won before anyone else. And that has value in journalism because you can sell it. You can sell, we are so fast. Our reporters are so fast, even our non-human reporters. So it's been quite successful for the AP in the last couple of years. And I want to show you a little bit of how it works. This is from the Wordsmith site in Durham, North Carolina. Add your data, write that template, and spit. It is on your page. QuakeBot works similarly, and several of these different programs do. So what's the problem with this? I mean, this sounds really awesome because don't reporters have more time, right? Well, there are some really, really good points to robots and newsrooms. But do I think that robots are going to replace flesh and blood, human writers? Not anytime soon. Not anytime soon. No, as I say. Because, because, I'll tell you why. It's not all bad news. This is not all bad news. 
I welcome my robot brothers and sisters. And I'll tell you why. Because our news business, the news cycle, has become so skinny down. There are so fewer reporters in newsrooms today than there ever were because you know new, news reporters are doing two, three, four beats, juggling their social media presence and multiple blogs and trying to fill all these different needs in a community. Well, having someone who can do menial tasks, having a program, a robot per se, who can do these menial number stories that might take a human being an hour and takes a robot two minutes, saves a lot of time. And that time can be spent on investigations, really digging into what, what do these numbers mean? What, what does this huge pile of documents, all of these numbers that have been given to me to investigate, how, how what is the true meaning behind it? So for me, it frees up time, valuable, valuable time, to do real, meaningful work in journalism. And I know for certain, because a friend of mine um, in North Carolina, he used to spend, he was a Friday night sports reporter, he would spend 45 minutes on a number story. So, you know, the classic Friday night football story. And that time could have been spent doing deeper stories on players, deeper stories on other problems within the sports industry, rather than doing his number story. So it does save, save time. But there are other things that robots can save for newsrooms. Now, during conflicts, during wars, during really hard times in different countries, news outlets send their reporters into the midst of it to try and get a, an honest look at what's happening, right? We used to call them embedded reporters because literally they would go into a war conflict with the military men and many times would get hurt themselves, either shot or killed. And there, there's, it's totally unnecessary deaths because I propose if we're using technology, why not use news drones to go into a conflict zone, to use video until there's an absolute need for a human reporter to be on the site, as long as you can send, send video back. And so I suppose and propose that robots can save lives within journalism. In fact, last year, 48 people lost their lives covering news. They were either murdered, they were in war situations, or on very, very dangerous assignments. So this is a real and true danger for journalists that go into war conflict areas. And in fact, this number is the highest that has been in at least 10 years. So it's a real and true need that could help and serve journalists if robots were used in that way and complex things. So why, why then do I say, well, no robot could replace me, no robot could replace a thinking human being? Because human stories are complicated. Emotions are mixed up. We can be happy and sad at the same time. And I don't think that technology has caught up to that point of being able to thoroughly filter what emotions mean. Because the human experience is still quite human. And because citizen journalism has very clearly shown that people want to be involved in journalism, whether or not they've ever been to a journalism school. So people love people stories. We crave those Justin Bieber stories like it's candy. And I'm not sure that a non-feeling being, a robot, could, could do it justice. And I'm going to give you three reasons why, three examples. And these are from my writing experience. 
Um, the first is a story about children with not enough to eat. And many times, when we say that phrase, we think of maybe a country like Africa. But this was happening in my backyard in North Carolina. There were programs that were set up, increasingly so, for children in the summertime who weren't eating enough because, or weren't eating at all throughout the day because they were used to having that meal at school. And that was the most balanced meal they had all day long because their family, their parents, maybe worked two, three jobs and couldn't be at home to feed them. This story was a, a heartstring story, as we say. It made you feel, feel something. I'm not sure a robot could have done that. <laughs> Excuse me. The next story I want to tell you, I need you to tug on your imagination again. I was approached by a mother after the death of one of her sons. And because I was a mother myself, the story was particularly meaningful to me. She said that her old, older son, he was 11 at the time, he had been playing in his room. And her younger son didn't hear him playing anymore. And was curious. Her younger son was nine at the time. He was curious, and so he just walked into his brother's room, and he saw that the light was on in his brother's closet, and he comes around the door, and he sees his 11-year-old brother hanging from a belt in his closet. And of course, he was dead. And uh, at the time, this mother, at the moment she was telling me this story, was telling me how much her surviving son was struggling with the grief of losing his brother. And how he had, he had gone so far as to be so angry that she had to pull him out of school sometimes and put him in a boxing program. He was the only um, Caucasian child in this mostly African-American community boxing program. And that somehow, this program had brought him out of grief and had given him a new purpose in life. And I sat with this mother as she cried. I followed this family to boxing matches. I sat with this family as they found out that she was pregnant with twins and that he was going to be a brother again. It was two years that I spent with this family through their most turbulent times. I'm not sure that a robot would be welcomed into a family situation that tough and tense. And the last story that I want to tell you is a story that I worked on for about the same amount of time. It's probably closer to three years. And um, the man you see here he and his daughter, well, the man you see here, was a, um, a very tough, tough military man in the Marine Corps. And he loved his daughter, Jamie, was her name. Here, she's about nine years old. And imagine being a father, loves his daughter, and find out one day that she has a very rare cancer. And Imagine how angry he was when he found out that she got this rare cancer by drinking the water, by bathing in the water that was flowing from the taps in the house that they lived on U.S. government property because there was gasoline in the water. And gasoline, the stuff we pour into our cars, is highly highly toxic and causes cancer in children, in adults. And imagine his heartbreak when his little girl died. And he wanted justice for her. He wanted to help her. And I was sitting in his living room and he's telling me this story. And I had one child at that point. She was quite young. She was almost Jenny's age. And this great man he was 
he was heavier than he is here, started crying. I mean, weeping, tears. And if there's one thing, I cannot just sit there when a man is just crying. That, that does not happen for me. I'm a tender-hearted gal. And I'm thinking about this story while I'm writing this presentation. And I'm thinking, could a robot have empathized with this man? You know, what would he have said? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. My, your tears do not compute. I don't know. I don't think so. What I did, I cried with the man. If you looked at my notes today, you would see these tear stains because I couldn't do anything but. He was so heartbroken. Now imagine... Over time, he finds out that this military has been hiding this from potentially a million people who lived on this military base. And so it was a passion that drove him to work for justice, not just for her, his daughter, but for these many, many hundreds of thousands of people affected by drinking that water, by bathing in that water, by cooking their spaghetti in that water. And so that's what I challenge you today, is that these programs are amazing and they help journalists, they're a tool, but I don't think that they will ever replace human beings who, as journalists, we step into the stories, we step into the emotions of the people that are talking to us. They're pouring out their lives to us and we take a little bit of that with us and we pour a little bit of that into the stories that we write, that we record for radio, that we write for, for broadcast, and I don't think that can be ever replaced, not yet, by a robot. And I want to thank you very much for seeing this tonight.